Christmas Eve, a young couple in love with everything to look forward to in the future, celebrating with their families, a new baby boy on the way, when all of a sudden, Lacey Peterson vanishes. Lacey Peterson is eight months pregnant and she is still missing tonight. Modesto police say 27-year-old Lacey Peterson was last seen walking her dog in a neighborhood park on Christmas Eve. Run to the side. My daughter's been missing since this morning. She's eight months pregnant. before Christmas Eve, the last time anybody has heard or seen Lacey, everything seems normal. At 8.30 p.m., she has a conversation with her mother on the phone. They talk about what happens the next day. But the next day, there's, there's this huge gap of time that nobody really knows for sure what happened, except for Scott Peterson. Although she had the day off work and planned to host her family for dinner that evening, Sharon Roach's Christmas Eve began as routinely as any other Tuesday. She'd gone to a matinee that afternoon with a friend, and normally she would have invited her daughter Lacey to the theater as well, but she knew that in her third trimester with baby Connor, sitting for a movie would have been uncomfortable for her, so she hadn't extended the invitation. After the movie, Sharon parted ways with her girlfriend Sandy, and headed home to prepare for dinner. She expected Scott and Lacey, along with some of Ron's family, around 6 o'clock. Still working in construction, Ron rose before the sun that morning as he always did, and headed to his office in Lodi. When the boss gave him the rest of the week off for Christmas, knowing Sharon had plans with Sandy, Ron picked up his paycheck and had a mind to get some fishing in that afternoon. But before he headed to one of his favorite fishing spots back near the house, he took a trip to Los Banos to check the progress on a work site, and wished the guys a Merry Christmas. Then, he headed to Oakdale to fish. For Ron, Oakdale was a bit of a secret spot for good bass fishing, and because it was only about 16 miles from his house, he'd been there many times before. He especially enjoyed watching the black bass jump up out of the water for the bait. Ron had even convinced Sharon to join him on a rare fishing trip to his favorite spot about 10 days prior, though she mainly watched and they didn't catch anything. The bass weren't jumping much for Ron that afternoon either, so after a few hours, he headed home. He got back to the house a little before 3 o'clock, and settled into his recliner, occasionally stepping out to the garage for a cigarette, while Sharon set out dishes and ingredients for dinner that night. Ron read his newspaper while she prepared the dessert, but she soon realized that she'd forgotten to buy whipped cream. She had Ron call Scott and Lacey to ask them to grab some on their way over, and she put her casserole in the oven. As Sharon began to dress for dinner, her biggest concern might have been her unfinished chocolate pie. But that was before Scott's phone call changed everything. Now, just five hours later, Sharon sat on the curb, clutching a quilt in her arms, as a helicopter scanned the park for signs of her pregnant daughter. And though Sharon passed around all of the coats and blankets she could find from home, she'd held onto that heavy patchwork quilt, a gift she'd received from her own mother years earlier, and told her friend Sandy, this one is for Lacey, she'll be cold when we find her. Scott spent most of that evening with law enforcement. He walked them through the house and courtyard and allowed them access to both of the small sheds in the backyard. He also let them look through both of their vehicles. And he told them what he'd come home to after his Berkeley fishing trip. He comes home later in the day, realizes that she's not there, figures she's somewhere else, running errands, doing something for Christmas Eve and takes the time to put his clothes in the wash, take a shower, have a snack, and then realizes maybe I should call somebody. So here's what's unusual. Scott decides to call Lacey's mother. Doesn't say, have you spoken to Lacey today? Do you know where she is? He says, Lacey is missing. The word missing right away struck a chord with everybody. When you hear Sharon Rocha describe that moment and what that was like, you know, the the ground going out from underneath you, your heart sinking to the floor. What do you mean missing? That's a, that's a very important word. By this point, Sharon's average day had descended into madness and chaos, beginning mere seconds after Scott told her Lacey was missing, 
and it would be a long time before her life would seem anywhere near normal again. Later that night, Sharon noticed Scott standing alone in the driveway, staring vacantly in the direction of the park, and approached him. She loved Scott like a son, and knew this must be terrible for him. But much like their encounter in the park earlier, he still didn't look at her. She imagined he must be scared out of his wits, and in shock. For her it was her little girl, her best friend, and her heart, but Sharon tried to empathize with Scott as well. For him, it was his darling wife, and his beloved baby boy, and she had no expectations for what his reaction should be. She offered a hug, hoping they could comfort each other as this nightmare played out, but he turned away from her, shifting his body as she outstretched her arms. She brushed it off, and instead of consolation, tried to get some information from him instead. Sharon began by asking about his family. None of Scott's relatives lived anywhere near Modesto, and she wondered if any of them were on their way to the valley. But he hadn't even called his parents yet, which she thought was a little strange. In fact, as she would soon find out, no one in Scott's family got a call from him, until the following day. Then, she asked about Lacey's plans for that morning. Scott said she'd intended to get some groceries for Christmas brunch, and that she was also going to bake some gingerbread. He said she'd mentioned taking Mackenzie for a walk, but she recalled later that getting information from him was like pulling teeth. When she asked where he'd been that day, he'd responded with a single word, fishing. She was surprised to hear he'd been fishing, Sharon hadn't known him to be an avid fisherman, but she was even more surprised to learn where he'd gone to fish, and when. Scott didn't volunteer that he'd gone an hour and a half away to Berkeley, at nearly one o'clock in the afternoon. She had to ask. And when he answered, she thought it was strange for him to deep-sea fish on a chartered boat, so late in the day. She had only ever known those rented fishing boats to leave the marina quite early in the morning. Which is what she assumed he meant when he said he'd fished in the bay that day, because Sharon still had no idea, that Scott had his own boat. He didn't volunteer much, so she asked him what time he got home, but when he said he got back at a quarter to five, she paused for a moment. Sharon recalled looking at her clock at home at 5.15, just before he'd called her. She realized a full half an hour had passed with Lacey not home, before Scott tried to find out where she was. Her next question was, why did you wait so long to call me? He simply said, I thought she was at your house and I was running late, so I took a shower, then I called you. For the moment, Sharon had no reason not to trust Scott's explanations, motives, or version of events. But soon, his delay in calling her would only add to a growing list of concerns. She would become more and more fretful over her missing daughter, and far more confused about Scott's bizarre behavior, after her disappearance. She moved on to asking about whether they'd made it to the hospital the day before, to pre-register for Connor's delivery in February. He said they didn't go, but for some reason she didn't ask why they never made it. When she offered her open arms for another attempt at a hug, and he shifted his body away from her again, deflecting her a second time, she certainly noticed it was strange. But again, she attributed his odd response, to shock and fear, not giving his reaction much thought at the time. And as her mind was racing in the chaos of the scene, her attention was soon drawn elsewhere. Throughout the entire conversation, he never did look at her, and Sharon never did hug him. Although she found it difficult to get information from Scott, it doesn't seem like she pressed him too hard for answers that night. However, Scott did offer up some unsolicited information, to Sharon's friend Sandy that evening. Sandy recalled standing on the driveway alone, watching the police, when Scott approached her. He told her he was a sportsman, and that he cut his hands all the time. Then he told her, he wouldn't be surprised if they found blood, in his truck. Meanwhile, as Sharon's cousin Gwen consoled her, Gwen's husband Harvey, joined nearly a hundred friends, family, and neighbors, who'd shown up to canvas the park for Lacey. Shortly after arriving with his brother to search around seven o'clock, Harvey came back to the house, to get a better description from Scott about what Lacey'd been wearing that day. Scott was pacing on the driveway, talking on the phone, when Harvey arrived. After trying to get Scott's attention, asking several times about Lacey's clothing, and where he'd been that day, Scott finally hung up the phone and responded to Harvey. He said Lacey was wearing a white top and black pants, and that he'd been at the golf course. Harvey told him about the growing number of people down in the park searching, and Scott's eyes widened with surprise. He thought at the time that Scott's reaction was amazement with the community response. 
Harvey figured he was shocked at the number of people who'd put their plans and families aside on Christmas Eve to search for Lacey, and didn't think much about it. At least not until later that evening, when he heard about Scott's fishing trip to Berkeley from his wife. Harvey couldn't figure why he told him he was on the golf course, if he'd actually been ocean fishing, and his suspicion of Scott took root immediately. As his mistrust grew, Scott's surprise at the number of searchers and rapid police response seemed to Harvey to be more like a deer in the headlights. He began to see Scott's look of surprise, as an expression of fear at the realization of how many eyes were on him so quickly, rather than amazement for the outpouring of concern from their community. While neither Harvey, nor anyone else he shared the information with, told law enforcement about Scott's conflicting alibi story or his deer-in-the-headlights stare before the following summer, Harvey remained suspect of Scott. And in the coming days, he would do a bit of investigating of his own. Shortly after Harvey headed back into the park to continue searching, Ron showed up on the scene and began to talk with officers Spurlock and Letzinger. When Scott noticed Ron on the driveway talking with police, he came over and greeted him immediately. Ron seemed glad to see Scott, and one of the first things he asked him was, how was your golf game today? When Scott said he decided to fish that day rather than hit up the fairway, Ron was a bit surprised to hear it, and asked about his fishing trip. Scott began to give Ron the details about his visit to Berkeley, but when he said he left home at 9.30, Ron stopped him. He made a joke about fishing so late in the day, saying that by that time of the morning, he's usually about done fishing, not just getting started. Judging by his reaction, Scott didn't care much for Ron's commentary. He didn't respond, and walked away. Officers Spurlock and Letzinger didn't see the humor either, but they definitely took notice, exchanging a look between them as he left the group. Later that evening, Ron shared the interaction with Sharon. At the time, he was worried that he'd made Scott look bad in front of the police. A couple of hours after Ron arrived, authorities cleared the public from the park to enable the helicopter to easily identify her body heat. When the search failed, picking up no sign of Lacey, a somber silence fell over the crowd at the house. Things were fairly quiet with nobody talking much, when Detective Al Brocchini arrived on the scene. Detective Brocchini had been with the Modesto PD for around eight years, when he met Scott Peterson on December 24, 2002. But he'd been an Alameda County Sheriff's deputy for several years prior to his move to Modesto. The only detective called to the scene that evening, Brocchini responded after finishing his Christmas Eve dinner, while out of town with his family. At the time, the call was classified as a suspicious missing persons case. As he made the 75-mile drive to the Peterson house, he had no idea what an understatement that classification would turn out to be. He arrived at either 9.30 or 10.30 that evening, depending on whether you refer to Detective Brocchini's report or Sergeant Dewerfeld's, as they conflict concerning the hour. Detective Brocchini received the bulk of his initial briefing from the sergeant and walked through the house with officers Spurlock and Evers, getting their input along the way. After their walkthrough, Brocchini asked to meet Scott. The detective approached him in the driveway, among a group of other people, and introduced himself. After explaining what his role would be in the search for his missing wife, they took another tour of the house, together. By now, Brocchini was well aware of the red flags that prompted Sergeant Dewerfeld to call a detective to the scene at this hour on Christmas Eve. The sergeant had already briefed him on the odd things they'd found in the house including the mops and empty bucket outside the door, the scrunched-up rug at the threshold, and of course, the full-page ad for a defense lawyer Scott's phone book happened to be open to when they arrived. Brocchini also knew Scott had his boat launch ticket from the marina in his pocket, ready to hand over to Officer Evers shortly after police arrived on the scene. Scott didn't seem to have an issue talking about his Berkeley trip, or his recently purchased boat, as he walked through the house with the responding officers that evening, and this tour with Brocchini was no different. He answered the detective's questions as they went from room to room, explaining the things that were out of place, and giving more details about the day. But Brocchini didn't take many notes during this initial walkthrough, and he destroyed the few he did take not long afterward, making them unavailable for the record. As he made his way into the master bedroom, he saw Lacey's purse in the closet, took a look inside, but didn't remove anything, and hung it back on the hook, before moving on. But Brocchini later said that he noticed a disturbed area on the comforter in Scott and Lacey's room, that appeared to be in the shape of a body. For now, he moved on to the spare bedroom. Lacey had long since filled the closet in their master bedroom, 
so Scott used this closet for his things instead. On the floor, the detective noticed an open Nike duffel bag, along with another bag pulled from its place on the shelf, resting on the hangers. It appeared that whoever'd been in this closet, had been in a hurry. Scott told him after pulling the Nike bag off the shelf, he knocked the other bag down with it, grabbed the shoes he was looking for, and hadn't bothered to put things back. He said he put his shoes on the wet bar, where he and Lacey both kept their sneakers, but that hers weren't there when he got home. But later, when Brokini saw a small bar in the house, and it didn't have Scott's shoes on it either, he took it as a sign of deception. Even though Scott's tennis shoes were later found on the large wet bar in the backyard where he said they would be, the bit of honesty certainly wasn't enough to make Detective Brokini back off. His list of suspicions grew steadily as the case progressed, and he would soon discover that Scott's deception went far beyond an attempt to conceal a pair of tennis shoes. As they moved into the family room, Brokini also became curious about the pile of dirty rags on the washing machine and what they'd been used to clean up. But Scott's explanation didn't help his case with Brokini in the slightest. He said that Margarita Nava, their new housekeeper, dirtied the towels on her visit the day before, but he couldn't recall exactly what she cleaned with them. He removed the rags from the basin of the washer when he got home that afternoon, stripped off his clothes, threw them in the wash, and left the rags on top of the washer. While the rags were certainly a point of interest, what the detective thought was most odd, was Scott's apparent rush to wash the clothes he'd gone to Berkeley in. He said he was a bit soggy from his fishing trip, and that it had started to rain while he was in the boat. But he would say later, that it was also part of his routine, and that he often stripped off his clothes soon after he came in. He said working with chemicals forced him into the habit of changing and washing his clothes first thing when he came home. When Brokini took a look at the damp blue jeans, the blue t-shirt, and the green pullover hoodie, that were still stuck to the sides of the wash tub after the spin cycle, he took note of the fact that they had also been washed alone. Scott and Lacey's laundry set was behind an accordion door in their family room. There was a wicker basket of clean folded things on the dryer, and the dirty laundry hamper was in their master bedroom. As they continued the walkthrough, Brokini saw some of Scott's long guns in the house, and took the opportunity to ask if Scott owned any handguns. When he said he had a 22 caliber pistol in his glove box, they made their way out to the driveway to search through his truck. But as Brokini opened the door to get a look at the gun, Scott stopped him. When he dinged Lacey's Land Rover with the door, Scott found a glove to put between his door and her SUV to protect the paint. After ticking off another box on his list of weird behaviors from Scott, Detective Brokini proceeded with his search. Along with the pistol in the glove box, he also recalled seeing a camouflage jacket in the back seat. Scott said he wore the jacket along with a tan fishing hat, while he was in the boat, after it started to rain a bit. Though we don't have his notes from the search, Brokini later testified that the camouflage jacket, was dry to the touch. Brokini also found a shopping bag from a sporting goods store, and took a look inside. The shopping bag contained a couple of fishing lures, and a receipt. The two saltwater lures in the bag were still in their packaging. The fishing pole on the receipt was intended for use in saltwater, and was later found in the boat. But the receipt from the Big Five store on the 20th of that month, also recorded the purchase of one of the biggest pieces of evidence in the case against Scott. Even more damaging than the handgun in the glove box was Scott's two-day fishing permit, only valid for the 23rd and 24th of December, the precise time frame of his wife's disappearance. Brokini was unaware of this damaging detail the night Lacey went missing, but when he and his colleagues learned of it, they unanimously agreed that it reeked of Scott's guilt and long-term premeditation to harm his wife. The search through Scott and Lacey's vehicles that night was brief. Brokini and the other officers hadn't done much more than open the doors and look inside at that point, but they did notice Lacey's cell phone, still connected to the charger in her Land Rover. It had enough battery to power on briefly, but turned right back off again. After looking through the house and the cars, Brokini spoke with Ron and Sharon, suggesting that they head home and try to get some rest. Before they left, she told Scott to come back to her house when he was done with the detective, not to worry about what time it might be, that they would be up. She didn't want him to have to be alone, and she knew that until Lacey was safe at home, there was no chance that she'd be able to sleep. Brokini assured them he would bring Scott back, as soon as they had the information they needed. And so, Sharon headed home to face what would be one of the longest nights of her life. After the last of the dwindling crowd returned to their families that Christmas Eve, 
she and her son Brent sat together at her kitchen table, comforting each other, as their lives twisted into a dark mangled version of what they used to be. And Sharon vowed not to close her eyes, until she saw her daughter again. Meanwhile, Detective Brocchini prepared to take a look at Scott's boat. But first, he wanted to document the peculiar evidence they'd already found in the house. As they were leaving, he asked if it would be all right to have his team take some pictures of the house, for the investigation. Scott gave his permission for the photos, and headed for Brocchini's unmarked police car. But as the detective reached for his keys to unlock the doors, they weren't there. He'd apparently set them down on the wheel well of Scott's truck. After Brocchini went back for his keys, the two of them rode to the warehouse a few miles away, with Officer Evers following in his patrol car. On Christmas Eve, he, he was cooperative. In my mind, I'm not even thinking he did it yet. But I am documenting all this stuff. When we get to his shop to look at his boat, Scott tells me I have no power in the shop, meaning there's no lights. This shop is in a strip mall, and it's, it's the middle of the night. There ain't nobody there. It's just us. And so I'm not even thinking that's suspicious. I just, okay, there's no power. Do you mind opening the door? I'll put my headlights in. I want to look at the boat. So I, I put my headlights in, and I take four or five pictures, you know, of the boat. After Brocchini got a few pictures of the boat and took a peek inside Scott's tackle box, he was ready to head to the station for Scott's interview. But they made a stop along the way, at Ditto's, where Detective Brocchini was introduced to Michelle Boer. Michelle was a friend of Lacey's and the owner of the spa she visited the day before. She also happened to know the owner of Ditto's print shop. She'd received a call around 10 p.m. from one of Lacey's best friends, Renee Tomlinson, asking for her help making flyers for Lacey. The two opened up the print shop around 11.30 to start working, but they needed Scott to confirm some of the information on the flyer. Rather than wait until after their trip to the police station, Brocchini and Scott went to Ditto's, directly from the warehouse. Scott confirmed the correct contact number and double-checked the rest of the information. But while they were there, Brocchini made some comments to Michelle over her shoulder as he watched her work on the flyers. She clarified later in court that their interaction was brief, she didn't even qualify it as a conversation, and she couldn't recall what he said. But the report Brocchini wrote later that detailed her statements that evening, possibly indicate otherwise. According to his report, Michelle Boer asserted that this would be the last night she would be willing to join search efforts to help find Lacey, because she felt Scott was responsible for her disappearance. Brocchini documented her statement that on his visit to Ditto's that night, Michelle told him she wouldn't be working further on the case, because she suspected Scott. In court, Michelle said the timing of that statement was inaccurate, that she hadn't said that until Christmas Day. In any case, while there was no elaboration in the trial record as to what raised her suspicions, Michelle Boer didn't have any further involvement in the search for Lacey. She'd even begun to avoid their mutual friends because they remained supportive of Scott. She specifically included Lori Ellsworth, Stacy Boyers, and Renee Tomlinson in a later statement, claiming the girls made her uncomfortable because she felt like they were defending him. In the report he filed that evening, which included information about the house, the warehouse, and his interview with Scott, he not only failed to note Michelle Boer's statement, but omitted the stop at Ditto's entirely. Brocchini recorded the detour he and Scott made to the print shop, along with Michelle's statements about Scott, at the end of January, in a report written a few days after his first official interview with her. After making a second trip to the warehouse to retrieve his notebook, which he'd left in the boat, they made their way to the police station. As he sat in the interview room waiting for the detective to come in, he stared intently at a picture of Lacey, returning it to his pocket as Brocchini came in. The detective told Scott to begin going over the things they'd already discussed, starting with that morning. He wanted to take some notes, and possibly jog Scott's memory about what happened that day. Scott said when he got up around 8 o'clock that morning, Lacey was already out of bed, and by the time he showered and told her good morning, she was dressed and had eaten breakfast. She still had some morning sickness, and would feel nauseous if she didn't eat right away. At 8.40 that morning, the computer in the spare bedroom was used to visit a Yahoo weather forecast, the MSN homepage and two shopping pages. 
One of the items was a sunflower umbrella stand, and the other was a red gap scarf. They watched a bit of her favorite show Martha Stewart, while Scott ate his cereal. At this point, Brokini asked for details about what that morning's show was about. Scott told him Martha was talking about some type of cookie, and what to do with meringue. After he ate, he went out to the driveway and loaded three large patio umbrellas into the back of his truck, intending to store them at his warehouse. He waved to his neighbor as she walked by and came back into the house to prepare to leave. Before he left for the day, he filled the mop bucket for Lacey. She planned to mop the tile by the front door and the kitchen floor, but she wouldn't think of lifting anything heavy, so she asked him to fill the bucket for her. He filled it up, put the clean mop water by the front door, and said Lacey'd already started on the floors as he walked back outside. The neighbor Scott waved to before he left that morning was Kristen Dempulf. She was walking by the house, sometime between 9.20 and 9.40 that morning, when she saw Scott, bend over in the bed of his truck, as if he were loading or unloading something, but couldn't make out what it was. Kristen was returning home from a walk through the park that morning between 9 and 9.30, when she saw Scott on her way back home. She didn't see Lacey at the park or the house, but she did see a strange vehicle parked on the street that morning. Though Kristen made every effort to provide more detail about the description of the vehicle, she struggled to give police more information. Eventually, Kristen allowed herself to be hypnotized by a Modesto police officer, in an effort to bring more clarity to what she saw that day, though ultimately, the session didn't help to move the case forward. But Kristen did recall exchanging a greeting with Scott that morning, and waving hello as she walked by. Initially, Scott estimated that he'd left the house around 9.30, but that approximation would be adjusted later as his timeline was compared to cell tower data from his phone, and other witness statements as they emerged. The exact time he left the house fluctuated between roughly 9.30 and 10.08, depending on the source. This detail has been a major point of discussion from the start. A ping from Scott's phone at 10.08 that morning as he checked his voicemail came from a cell tower near the house, but it doesn't seem that the cell site information is very useful. An expert testified about the process, explaining that the towers share the influx of calls in the area. Meaning, that if one tower is busy, the next available site will route the call. We'll look at more of the phone tracking information when we get into the trial highlights. The message Scott retrieved from his voicemail at 10.08 that morning was from his boss, Eric Van Innes. He was calling to wish Scott and his family a Merry Christmas. When he arrived at the warehouse, he sent an email reply to Eric, wishing him the same, and checked his inbox for other messages. He spent another 20 minutes or so at a website for Delta Woodworking, browsing instructions for a tool he'd received on the 20th. Scott explained to Brocchini that the tool, called a mortizer, was for joining table legs, and that he'd spent some time putting it together before hooking up the boat. He said it wasn't until he got to the warehouse that he'd made up his mind to go fishing, instead of going to the golf course, saying it was too cold for golf that day. After using the computer from 10.30 to 11 o'clock, and spending about 20 minutes assembling the mortizer, he opened the large overhead door, and went out to his truck to grab a few things from his toolbox. When the metal lid cut his finger, Scott got into the cab and grabbed a napkin, leaving a few spots of blood on the interior of the driver's side door. After taking the tools into the warehouse, he backed his truck up to the overhead door, hooked the boat up to the hitch, and towed it out into the lot. Scott went back inside through the large bay door, closed it, and locked it behind him. He left the warehouse through the smaller office door. After securing it as well, he hopped in his truck and headed to the coast. He left the warehouse around 11.15 that day, and Brokini asked if he'd made it any stops on the way, to get lunch or buy bait. Scott told him he didn't make any stops, that he grabbed some leftover pizza when he got home, and that he didn't fish with bait. When he arrived at the marina just before 1 o'clock, he bought a $5 launch ticket from a machine near the public boat ramp. This is the same ticket he produced for Officer Evers later that night. Once he had the boat in the water, Scott headed north. After a couple miles, he found himself near a small island and decided to troll around the shallows a bit. This is when he realized he'd left the new saltwater lures in the truck, so he fished a little with his freshwater jig, but didn't catch anything. He told Brokini his main reason for going out on the water that day wasn't really about the fishing, he was interested in seeing how his new boat would fare in the water. After about 90 minutes, 
he headed back to the marina to pull the boat out of the water, and Rokini asked if he saw or spoke to anyone. Scott said he got a few laughs from a group of nearby maintenance workers, as he struggled to back his trailer down the ramp, and he talked to a couple of unlucky fishermen near the docks, who didn't get a fish that day either. As he left the marina around 2.15, he called Lacey and left her the following message. Hey beautiful, I just left a message at home. Uh, 2.15, a Lynn Berkman won't be able to get to Bella Farms to get that basket for Papa. I was hoping you would get the message and uh, go on out there. I'll see you in a bit, sweetie. Love you. Bye. About 10 minutes later, Scott called his friend Greg Reed, and then returned a call to his dad, Lee. Both were short conversations, Greg congratulated Scott on his new membership to the Del Rio Country Club, and shared the details for an upcoming New Year's party. And his father talked about their plans for Christmas Eve. Lee said he and Jackie planned to go to church that evening, and Scott told him about their dinner plans with Ron and Sharon that night. Either conversation lasted more than a few minutes, and Scott didn't mention his fishing trip to Greg or his dad. At 3.25 Scott stopped for gas at a Chevron station in Livermore. He paid at the pump with a card and didn't go inside. About a half an hour later, at just before 4 o'clock, he ran into a bit of traffic. Unable to go much over 55 with a boat and trailer, and knowing he was going to get home late, he tried to call Lacey again, at 3.52 p.m. Of course, he still got no answer, he didn't leave a message, and didn't try her cell phone. At this point in their interview, Brokini checked the messages and logs on both phones. After listening to the only other message left on Lacey's phone, he and Scott agreed that the gruffy-voiced message recorded at 5.30 was Ron Gransky. It was left around 15 minutes after he and Sharon got the call that she was missing, but wasn't detailed in the early police reports. After discussing the phone activity, Brokini asked if he saw anyone when he returned the boat to the warehouse. He told the detective there may have been people around when he'd been there that morning, but didn't see anyone when he came back, around 4.15 that afternoon. After unhooking the boat, he wasn't in the warehouse much longer than five minutes, before making the nine-minute drive back to the house returning between 4.30 and 4.45. Amy Craigbaum, who lived across the street, later confirmed the time he returned home. Amy noticed Scott's truck wasn't there when she left on an errand at 4.30, but she returned at 4.45 to see it backed into the driveway. Amy also said the Christmas lights at the Petersons came on just before he came home, causing her to assume Lacey must have been home to light them up. She wasn't, but as it turns out they weren't on timers either, they needed to be plugged in manually. Have any of your neighbors saw anything or heard anything? Um, first neighbor I checked with was directly across the street. Her name's Amy. It's her son who talked about the white truck. Mm-hmm. She mentioned the Christmas light things. Tell me about that. Um, she said that our outside Christmas light, the bicycle ones, went on uh, just before I got home. I didn't notice that they were on when I got home. And she, you know, she mentioned it across the street they were on. Um, they get plugged into an outlet. I didn't plug them in today. And then um, when we returned to the park a part later, they were off. So I don't know. I mean, it appears to still be plugged in and must have overheated or something. So Amy said just before you came home, the lights got turned on. She saw that. With her, um, went to the left, the one was there. Went to know to Karen's. Checked to the right of things. These Christmas lights, you got to plug them in yourself, you said? Yeah, there's an outlet outside in the storage shed area. Maybe you noticed that area. I saw where you had your lawnmower and stuff. Yeah, my golf bag lawnmower. And the door was open when I was in the right. Room. So in there, there's a plug, and you just plug it in, those lights go on. And then uh, you said they were on when you were talking to Amy. Right. A couple hours later, they were on. Yeah. But they were still plugged in. Yeah. Well, uh, I didn't go out and try the plug, so. Okay. But I don't see why they went to bed. Maybe they got you know, hit by a cat or something like that. Scott also mentioned Karen's service during this part of the questioning, the next-door neighbor who found Mackenzie with his leash on that morning, and put him back inside the gate. 
Karen spoke with police earlier that night by phone. Brokini doesn't focus on her much, though she would go on to become an important witness. We'll explore the details of her involvement later in the series. When Scott got home, he backed his truck into the driveway and Brokini wanted to know if that was common for him, to back his truck in. He said that it was, and that he did park that way often. But at the end of a fumbled explanation for why he backed into the drive, which Brokini didn't ask for, Scott mentioned the umbrellas. The detective took the opening to ask him on the record, why he had them in his truck. Okay, so then when you drive home, you back in? Yeah, you always do that? Yeah, I've had that box broken into a couple times. Well, I broke into it, I've scaled the lock a few times. Got the umbrellas, and now it's back here. Um, those umbrellas, were they in the car before? Could have been this morning, in mm-hmm. Tantalus, leaving at the warehouse. Did you them work with me? Yeah. I picked them up. So you put the umbrellas in there this morning because you were going to have a storm at the warehouse? Yeah, I think it was. Did you just forget? He doesn't seem to let on in the interview, but Brokini was ticking the boxes, adding to his growing list of Scott's suspicious behavior. And when he learned Scott had driven three of these large patio umbrellas all the way to the ocean and back, on the morning his wife disappeared, it checked off about half a dozen boxes, all at once. Scott continued with the steps he took once he got home, after backing the truck into the driveway. He went through the gate, saw Mackenzie with his leash on, removed it, and placed it on the wet bar in the backyard. When he went through the unlocked French doors, Mackenzie followed him in, but so did one of their cats. Scott and Lacey had two Siamese cats, Siam and Gracie. Whichever one came in behind him that day, went directly for the mop bucket. He thought the cat would knock it over or try to drink from it, so he dumped it into the dirt next to the house, and left the bucket outside. He checked the mail, then went back in to get the mops, and put them outside as well. But Brokini had more questions about the mops, If the housekeeper had just cleaned the floors the day before, why was Lacey mopping? Curious, uh, Maggie was there on uh, Maggie and Marguerite, but she was there on Monday, Mm -hmm. and obviously she did a lot of work, but the house was filthy. Why was your wife mopping on Tuesday morning? I don't know. She was pretty fastidious about it, though. Was she? With the dog and the cats and her, uh, you know doing the Christmas deal. That was, that was pretty common. After Scott washed his clothes, he grabbed a couple slices of pizza out of the refrigerator, apparently in his underwear or nothing at all at this point. He got some milk to go with his pizza, left the box on the counter, and ate the rest of his pizza in the shower. When he was out and dressed, he checked the messages on the answering machine. Scott told several people that night, including Detective Brocchini, that he assumed Lacey was at her mother's house helping with Christmas Eve dinner, until he played back the recordings. His own message played first, at 2.14 that afternoon, but afterward he heard Ron's, left over an hour later, asking him and Lacey to make a stop on the way over. That's when he said he realized something was wrong and called Sharon. Did you shower? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's pizza. Start the shower. Did you call after I get the shower? Put clothes on. That's when I checked the messages. Were there any? Yeah. Yours. Mine, there were three. Two for me, one for Ron, her stepfather, asking for whipped cream when you came up. And that's when I said, hey, where? She's calling me with whipped cream. 
but Brokini wasn't quite finished with his questions for Scott. He wanted to know more about his gun and his marriage to Lacey. He also wanted to know how Scott and Lacey felt about her walking through the park, alone. He started with the gun found in the glove box. When the detective asked how long the pistol'd been in his truck and where it came from, he said it had been there since his pheasant hunting trip to Lone Pine the month before, though he normally kept it in a small cabinet in the spare bedroom. He'd had the gun since he was a teenager, and thought it might even still be registered to his father. As he asked about the couple's past experiences and encounters in the park, Brokini knew the area was popular with the homeless community. In fact, Dry Creek Park served as a sort of cut-through, along the path to a nearby shelter for the dispossessed population of Modesto. Scott and Lacey were well aware of this, having some prior experiences with people in the park, those Brokini refers to as campers and bums, since they'd moved into the house, including some that involve contact with police. The few times you walked in the park, you said that uh, you have seen campers, bums, or whatever. Um, and has Lacey ever complained to you about somebody bothering No, I mean, like I said, no, and I don't think they ever come up to her and accost her in any way. Um, you know, she at the time said she's felt uncomfortable. Um, we've called you know, the police a couple times about people down there just to be able to move on. You know, I mean, it's um, not uncommon for Lacey or myself to you know, wake one of these guys or ladies up and tell them to get lost. With his own two dogs in mind, and having just met Scott and Lacey's golden retriever, the detective seems to doubt whether eight year old Mackenzie would be effective protection for Lacey if she were to need it on her walk. The dog is a, I mean, she's glad to have the dog, but the dog is, I got two to protect them. Her. It is, are they? He I is. Mean, uh, I'm in the yard and a guy comes up to me and the dog is, is fine. Uh, um, but it's been in the past when someone approaches her in our yard at least, um, that he's got protection with her. He looks, like he's been around the block, been around a while. Yeah, he's an old boy. Is he yours or yeah, um, she before got the marriage? Um, yeah, a month after we moved to the around all this gift. Is it us? Yeah. Oh, okay. he looked older than five years ago. Oh, yeah. No, he's, he's eight. Is he? Yeah. Eight or nine. What's your dog's name? Mackenzie. When it came to Lacey, and her marriage to Scott, their conversation was quite brief. You guys, you guys have had any problems, um, marriage problems? Everything's good. Mm-hmm. You've been married four years. After hearing Scott's account of what happened that day, and his explanation for the red flags littered through the house, including the gun in his truck, Brokini got consent to perform a gunshot residue test. While he got his kit ready, Scott asked if exhaust from an outboard motor like the one he had on his boat, could cause a false positive. Brokini reminded him that he showered recently anyway but said that no, the exhaust wouldn't flag the results. When the GSR test came back negative, Brokini asked if he would be willing to take a polygraph as well. Would you be willing to take a polygraph? Sure. After Scott consented, the detective went on to say he had a couple of concerns about the things he'd just told him, and got a little more confrontational. So you're telling me, Scott, that there's no, you'd have no idea where this is. Okay, I, I only have, I have a couple concerns. One is the cell phone call that you made. That if you listen to it, that call was made for 1217. The first one you made from uh, Berkeley. Yes. You say, 
Well, you said 217, but the timestamp on the call says 12 and 16. I mean, then to me, Oh, really? Oh, I saved it. Oh, yeah, you saved it. I handed it to you. You saved it. I mean, it said yesterday at 1217. You'd be right. 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 Okay. And you heard what I said when I said initially listened to it. It said received at 1216 or 216. Yeah. Though the detective had been wrong about the time of the call, Brocchini stuck with his instincts and asked again to administer a polygraph on Scott. Just to eliminate you as a suspect, you'd be willing to take the test. Okay. 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 Okay
but he never showed. They tried to call. He never called back, and he never came over. And when Sharon learned what he'd been doing that night, she was even more distressed and confused. We'll discuss what had Sharon so upset in our next episode, but his absence from the house that night, came directly on the heels of some unsettling news from Detective Brocchini, and by the time the sun came up Christmas morning, Lacey's family had every reason to be troubled. Shortly after they arrived home after the search, Ron told Sharon about a conversation he had with the detective as they were leaving. Before Brocchini advised them to head home and get some rest, he pulled Ron aside, for a word. During the quick conversation, the detective mentioned Scott's company warehouse, where he stored the boat he put in the water that day. Ron waited for the privacy of home to tell Sharon. She didn't even know he rented a warehouse area, let alone that he owned a boat and stored it there. She was shocked and knew right away that something wasn't right. Though they kept their opinions on the revelation of Scott's boat to themselves for quite a long time after, Sharon spoke freely with Ron that night. She told him she knew this meant he was hiding something, and she was certain he'd been lying about what he was doing that day. She speculated that he might be selling drugs, and she even suggested that he might have a girlfriend. But Sharon couldn't bring herself to think Scott was involved with harming Lacey. She told Ron as much, and he agreed. But over the next two weeks, they would begin to make some dark connections with a little help from Detective Brocchini, that would begin to drastically change their minds. Join us next time for law enforcement's response, to the field of red flags that surrounded Scott by Christmas Day. We'll also discuss his family's response to Lacey's disappearance, and to Brocchini's request to have their golden boy take a polygraph test. Subscribe and show your support if you're able. We know you won't want to miss Scott's question for Brocchini at 2 a.m., or his savage confrontation behind closed doors with Sharon, just as she began to consider whether Lacey may have been living with a monster.